let's pray and we will dive into God's word. Lord Jesus, we thank you so much for your gracious kindness to us in your word. Um, we ask that you do all the things you've promised to do when your people come and submit themselves to what you've spoken. So we might see your beauty, we might be conformed more to your image, that we might love more like Jesus, that we might know more deeply your love for us in the gospel, and we might tell the world more about it. We pray all this in your name. Amen. So if you've been with us the past few weeks, we're in the midst of a series called Some Assembly Required, looking at basic, basically the life of a Christian in the context of the local assembly, that is, the local church. That's what the Greek word ekklesia means, the gathering, the meeting, the service. And this week, we're going to look specifically at how the Bible, that's God's word to us, shapes our personal lives and our gathered lives. Um, this week, I was up in Johnny's office, and he has a tuning fork. And I've always heard about them. I've never really played with them. But you clang the fork on something, and it resonates at a specific frequency and produces a single note that any of the musicians can then tune their instruments to. But he also showed me, more than simply clanging it and holding it and hearing it, what you could do is you could strike that on your desk, and it begins to vibrate. And then he showed me what you do is you take that fork, and you set it against another object, and that object takes the frequency of the tuning fork and transfers it into that object, and so if you put it on your bookshelf, the whole bookshelf will start resonating to that same tune. It amplifies it. And it's a wonderful illustration of God's word, both in its nature and in its resource to us in the Christian life. And for many of us, when we think about God's word, our opinions are shaped off of two real and yet insufficient experiences. The first is that of personal subjective experience. Perhaps you tried to read the Bible and you read it once and you didn't have this transformative emotional experience. You didn't have immediate intellectual clarity where the floodgates of heaven were open to you. Because of that lack of experience, you made a conclusion. Or secondly, there's that of external criticism. Maybe you had a history teacher in high school, a or you know, your TikTok philosopher told you that there were some inherent contradictions in God's word, or the nature of it was an ordinary book written by ordinary people, and you heard that external criticism, and you came to your own conclusion about God's word. And while critical thinking and personal experience actually have a place in not only your relationship to God's word, but actually the defense of it, if we want to honestly and sincerely understand God's word, or even consider it, we need to put ourselves in submission to it. We need to see what God says about his word. This God who speaks what he says, and then we could judge the claims based off of that. And what we see today is that the Bible, it is, in a sense, simply a book. The Bible is not God, is not the distant fourth cousin of the Trinity, and yet, despite being a book, it is the primary way in which God has chosen to communicate who he is and what he's done to us as his people. Just as that tuning fork needed something to strike it, God's Holy Spirit has so struck the pages of scripture that it is alive with the power of the Holy Spirit. It is inspired by God. And the beauty of that is that when we take that and we touch our lives to it, we begin to resonate with the beautiful good news of who God is and what he's done for us. We become instruments of Jesus's continued grace, sounding more like him to a dying world and living more like him in our own personal joy. And this is why we begin our service with a call to worship that Paul read for us. Before anything happens, we read God's word. Why? So that we might become a light with the tone of God's word. That all of us as various people having various weeks of being rested and weary and even some of us restless, anxious, we come with all of our diverse experiences in here and we hear the tune of scripture and the Holy Spirit brings amongst us a unity of worship. And every Sunday we begin with God's word because the story of the Christian begins with God's word. 
In 1 Peter, Peter says that anyone who is a Christian is so because they have been born again by the living and abiding word of God. To be a Christian is to be many things, but it is to be a creature of the word. So what does it look like to believe what God says about his own word? What does he say about his word? And how does that shape the way you live during the week and our time gathered together on Sunday? Well, in looking at what Paul just read for us in Psalm 119, verses 129 through 136, we're gonna answer the question of why we read. Why do we read God's word? Why are we creatures of the word? With three answers. First, in verses 129 through 131, we see we read because God's word is wonderful. Secondly, in verses 132 through 135, we see God's word is effective. And then lastly, in Psalm 119, 136, we see that God's word is needed. With that said, let's read our first few verses today. If you have your Bible, you can open up in the middle. You'll probably land in Psalms, find the biggest chapter, and we're going to be beginning in verse 129. It says this, Your testimonies are wonderful, therefore my soul keeps them. The unfolding of your word gives light. It imparts understanding to the simple. I open my mouth and pant because I long for your commandments. So when we put together our Bible reading plan for this year, we did not intend for Psalm 119, 18 to come on this Sunday, and yet it did. In God's gracious providence, in my ignorance, it worked out beautifully. Because what we memorized this week as a church equipped us with a prayer that is most fitting for our study today. And that prayer is, open my eyes so that I may behold wondrous things out of your law. And this leads us to our first point this morning that we saw, and that is that God's word is wonderful. A theme that appears right there in our own text, Psalm 119, 129. And we really need to hear this idea that God's word is wonderful because we live in a world where anything wonderful or anything good or to that point anything true is often relative. Beauty, as they say, is in the eye of the beholder. This works for cars and works for art, works for food. But this kind of relativity does not work when it comes to our view of God's word. Let me give you an example. If someone showed you a piece of art that they just loved and they brought that art to you and they said, isn't this beautiful? And you found it not to be beautiful. We would assume that the problem was with the piece of art. That it didn't meet our standards. That it didn't meet our aesthetic image that we wanted. That it didn't please our palate and therefore the art was found lacking. It might be good for them, but not for you. But if we look at Psalm 119, 18, which open my eyes that I might see, behold wondrous things out of your law. If we look at Psalm 119, 129, your testimonies are wonderful, therefore my soul keeps them. If we see those together, what we see is the conclusion that if you examine God's word and you do not find it wonderful, The problem is not in the word. The problem is in your eyes. Your eyes are the bad ones. Your eyes are the broken ones. Psalm 119, 18. Now be careful. This is why we read God's word carefully. It's not teaching you to pray, dear God, make your word wonderful. That's not the prayer, is it? It is, oh Lord, open my blind eyes so that I might see what is already wonderful, what pre-existed prior to you coming to it that did not need your affirmation or your discovery to already be as miraculous, as pure, and as wonderful as it already is. This is reiterated in verse 129 where David says, your testimonies are wonderful. And in result of their wonder... He keeps them. God's word does not become wonderful as you keep it. It might become more comforting. It might become more trustworthy. It might become more beautiful as you experience it and enjoy it more and more. But God's word doesn't become wonderful because we believe it. As if God is Santa Claus or the tooth fairy and every time someone believes in him, he gets a little more sparkle in his eye. God's word is 
is wonderful. His story, his testimony, his self-revelation of himself to our world is objectively wonderful, which means there is only one right response to seeing his wonder, and that is to see it, to believe it, and to keep it. Anyone else who has an opposite response is responding poorly. The fault is with them. And that is how, as we'll talk in a little bit, all of us start. All of us are born blind to God's word. We are the world's worst art critics. We've looked at cat scratches in the mud all the while ignoring and finding the works of Michelangelo or da Vinci or name your beautiful artist and finding it to be distasteful. God's word is wonderful and we should want it. Why is it wonderful? Well, there's a number of reasons baked into this text. And first, there's because of what it is and what it does. What is it? At, at, you know, cause of being redundant, it is God's word. If that's what you take away from here today, that's all I want. The Bible is God's word. If you visit any museum, you'll see historically preserved documents written by the hand of George Washington, or maybe you'll visit and see Anne Frank's handwritten letters. And those documents are preserved, they're valuable, and they're of distinct importance because of who wrote them, of whose words and whose perspective they portray. The Bible, both in the Old and in the New Testaments, These 66 books, written by upwards of 35 people over thousands of years in three different languages, is collectively God's word. Just in the same way where if you go to Traveler's Rest and you see handwritten letters by Lewis and Clark, those are Lewis and Clark's words. This in the same way is God's word directly. Now, how does that match with us when I just said that this book is 66 books written across thousands of years by 35 different men in three different languages? Is God having a a self-identity crisis? Is he schizophrenic? No. What this means is that this is God's word because God in the Holy Spirit over history so inspired ordinary human men to write with their own voice, their own grammar, and their own expressions, all while simultaneously writing exactly what God wanted them to write through the power of the Holy Spirit. This is what Peter teaches us in 2 Peter 1, verses 19 through 20, where he says this, and we have a prophetic word more fully confirmed to which you will do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts, knowing this first of all. So what do we approach scripture with a first priority of thinking? What is a first principle in our understanding of scripture? That no prophecy of scripture comes from someone's own interpretation for no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. So this is what the Christian church has long called the doctrine of inspiration. And this is what allows Paul's letters to sound like Paul and Isaiah's prophecy to sound like Isaiah and for Deuteronomy to sound like Moses and yet for all of them to be God's word because the Holy Spirit used those human individuals to write exactly, no more and more less than what God himself wanted to write by the power of the Holy Spirit. And here's the comfort of this doctrine. The doctrine of inspiration is not just an answer on a theology exam. It's of deep comfort to us. And that's because it means the Bible is not a portal. Uh, I don't know if you saw advertised during this pandemic, Facebook's video chat system called The Portal. And it's this very Jetsons looking contraption that sits on your desk and has a screen and a camera and sometimes it even follows you around. And what happens is you open up the portal, you turn it on, you call grandma, you show her your new sweater, and there's this innate relational connection to it. But how many of us view scripture as a portal instead of just the word of God? It's as if we get up in the morning, we open it up, turn it on, 
We boot it up, we give a call, but sometimes he doesn't answer. Sometimes there's no communication. Sometimes he's busy. Sometimes there's bad connection. But the Bible is not a portal. The Bible is not a vessel of incantation where sometimes when God is static and sitting, we can find him. But if he's off doing other things in the world, he doesn't answer. The Bible is God's handwritten letter to us, meaning it cannot stop being God's word. It is always on, always speaking, always revealing the God who stands behind it for those who have eyes to see and ears to hear, to see and to hear. I'm not sure if you found, I just found it this week. There's a website called Cameo. It makes $52 million a year because you could go on it, and on a friend's birthday, you could pay a celebrity to call your friend and give them a personalized birthday message. But here for free, awaiting you every time you open it, is the very word of the triune God who spoke creation into existence. We have his word. And that means we know when God speaks. And because he speaks... It's illuminating to us. And that's something we just saw Peter use this analogy of. He says, pay attention to it, like a light shining in a dark place. David uses this theme again back in verse 130. He says, the unfolding of your word gives us light. It imparts understanding to the simple. God's word is wonderful because of what it is. It is God's word and it doesn't need you to affirm that. That's what it is, whether you realize it or not. But it is wonderful also because of what it does in our life. It gives us light. It draws us to itself so that we might have clarity as God's word unfolds in our life. If this word is God's word, then it would do us well, as Peter says, to pay attention to it. Why? Because of things we already know. Our world is dark and our sin is messy, but God's word gives us light. It gently comes to even the most simple. It comes to me when my daughters at night are, uh, I think Shelly was telling me last week that kids become thirsty philosophers at bedtime. When they're having these existential crises at bedtime, God's word is simple enough for my four-year-old. Yeah, God's word is profound enough for scholars to spend their lives hardly scratching the depth of what it teaches us about the Lord. And it's from these pages of scripture that we find what Peter says in 2 Peter 1.3, that in this are all things pertaining to life and godliness. All the doctrine of the Christian church, all the reasons we do what we do as the church come from this book. We don't come together and say what is most effective or pragmatic or trendy or culturally appealing. It comes from this book. And yet the Bible is more than just doctrine. It illuminates not only what we should believe, but it actually illuminates how we should live and the story of our lives. It's a story of how this whole thing started, of what went wrong, and of what the loving and eager plan of God is to redeem it through his son. When we read and understand that story, that's the story of scripture, that this isn't just a textbook that you pick up and say, what is my truth for today? But this is actually a story of God's actions throughout history to redeem his people, when we realize that, we find in our lives that this story makes sense of our story. That these shortcomings, that these issues, and that God's promise being big enough for those in here helps give us clarity in our own lives. Most of us find the Bible intimidating because we don't pick up on this divine history which helps us see our story. And so what I want to do, and I just want to take uh, two minutes here, I want to give us a, a flyover picture of what the story of Scripture is. And this helps us as if you find yourself reading in Deuteronomy one day or in Isaiah one day or in the book of Acts one day, where are we and what is going on? And so in the Pentateuch, that's the first five books of the Bible, we see how God created everything great and how sin ruined everything how the fall permeated all of creation. But then what we see is God's plan to gather his people again. That God was going to create a people 
in his presence, in his place, and he was going to do it by his promise. God had covenanted to redeem his people. And then we get into some books which can generally be called the history. And this is, you know, First and Second Chronicles and First and Second Kings and First and Second Samuel. And when we're in those books, we read how difficult it was for God's people to keep up their end of their promise. Even their best kings, even their best military victories, even their best riches failed to actually secure their loyalty and their trust in God. And here we see the danger of misplaced hopes and of false idols of turning away from God and trusting in the vices of the world never leads to flourishing, it only leads to pain. But then in the prophets, we read of primarily two things. First, God speaks to this faithless people who he promised that he would redeem. And he says, if you keep running from me, if you keep disbelieving me, if you keep worshiping idols who cannot speak to you, then you will incur wrath. I will judge you, I will discipline you, I will call you back in a painful way. But secondly, he says, but I will keep my promise. There will be among you a faithful people, a repentant people. And as those repentant people endure, I will make my people new. I will bring you into my place, into my presence, and you will be my people. And one day, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will do just that. And then we get into the New Testament and we encounter the Gospels. That's Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John for accounts of the good news of what Jesus is doing. We're taking a break from the Gospel of Luke to do this story or to do this series. And in those Gospels, we see that Jesus is this long-awaited answer to God's promise. It is Jesus who is the perfect prophet, the perfect king, and the perfect priest, the one whose obedience leads the people into flourishing because he is able to not sin. We see that he's the perfect person that you and I were meant to be. If we compare ourselves to each other, we will always seem to feel better than the person sitting next to us. But if we compare ourselves to Jesus, we see all of us have a need. Jesus is perfect and we were not. And this Jesus died a sacrificial death for sinners so that all of the promises that Jesus kept in his perfect obedience can actually be applied to imperfect people by faith. We get the fruit of the promise that Jesus kept in our place. And then in most of the New Testament, we see this new promise, this new people of God that's brought about through Jesus' fulfillment of the law. And they're gathering together in churches and they're realizing what it means to live Holy Spirit-inspired lives on mission for the glory of God. And then we get to that last chapter of, or that last book of Revelation where God says, finally, I will bring about my people in my place, in my direct presence, in that new heaven and new earth, and I will make all things new. This word is a wonderful word. This is a story of what an amazing God did to save a wretched person like me and you. It's not a story of what you must do to be saved, but a story of what Jesus did to save sinners and restore us to God. People often ask me how I ended up in ministry, and it's in part because of the wonderful word of God. When I was in college, by the time I graduated, this sounds silly, this is one interesting aspect of my life. I was an Emmy award-winning sports journalist, and I was also on staff part-time at the church. I was in two possessions, or professions, each which got to proclaim news, talk about news. And yet, what won me to ministry Out of sports, I love sports. Yesterday, as a sports fan and a Titans fan, was just eviscerating. I pray against my love for sports. But despite my love for sports, I saw that this news is wonderful news. This news is life-changing news. This testimony is beautiful news. This is good news news. And if God's word is that wonderful, what is the effect it should have on us? We should desire it. Psalm 119, 131. I open my mouth and pant because I long for your commandments. 
Because this is God's word, because it is wonderful, because it is the story that makes sense of our own world, we pant for it, meaning we don't say what is the bare minimum. We say, how do I get more of God's word into my life? How do I see more of his beauty in the pages of scripture? And this is where the church plays an influential role to set the tone for the rest of our week. We want our services to be places where we are saturated with God's word. My house is just a couple blocks from Bridge Pizza and every so often God plays this practical joke where he causes all of the odors of delicious pizza to infuse my house. And all I can think about is wanting to eat more of it. That's what this gathered body is meant to do with God's word. For those who come here, we want you to smell the goodness of what is available to you right here that you can have, the bread of life given for all who would see it. This is why not only do we have the call to worship, but we've got a scripture reading, which Katie read to us. Wasn't that a great passage today in light of what we're doing? Again, didn't plan that. God is kind. That's where we were in our scripture reading. And this is why at the end of that reading, we did two things. We remind ourselves what we just read. This is the word of the Lord. And then we remind ourselves in light of that that we are immensely grateful. Thanks be to God. It is not a casual thing we read over. It is something we want to remind each other of what it is and how we should pant for it and say, praise God that we have his word. This is why the longest portion of our time together is this, the sermon, where we preach an expository sermon, not on today's culture, not off our felt needs of our heart, but what the Bible has presented to us, and we begin to submit ourselves to it and expound what God has spoken to us. This is why, I don't know if you've noticed, but on our worship slides, there's scripture in between those slides. We want you to realize that if you just sang something that seemed wonderful to you, that the thrust of that beauty, the source of that inspiration was scripture itself, that scripture causes us to sing. It's why we conclude our sermon or a service with a benediction from God's word meant to send you out into the world full of the promise of God's redemptive blessing in your life to serve, to speak the gospel throughout the week. It's why we want to invite you to do daily Bible reading with us as a church If this has been a hard thing for you, if reading God's word has been hard, then feel no shame of reading it with other people. It is hard for all of us. No one starts in the weight room benching 225 pounds, except for Sean Linehan. No one starts running marathons right out of the gate. You start as little weak people and you grow. This is a place where we can grow together. If you are so intimidated at reading God's word, come to our Bible study on Wednesday afternoons at noon. You come here in person, you could join it online. The easiest place to see that God's word is wonderful. It's why we're memorizing scripture. It's why our women's ministry is doing a study on the Old Testament. It's why GCF preaches on campus every week. It's why our kids' ministry and the ladies who are working there are beginning to implement times where our kids' workers are praying scripture over your kids. We want God's word because it is God's word and it is wonderful. But not only is God's word wonderful, it's also effective. Effective to do real things in your life. And this is where David wants to show us our next point. God's word is effective. We read because God's word is effective. Effective for what? We're gonna see two things in this passage. Effective to bring us freedom from slavery and effective to show us the favor of God. Let's see if you could discern these two ends in verses 132 through 135. Turn to me, be gracious to me, as is your way with those who love your name. Keep steady my steps according to your promise. Let no iniquity get dominion over me. Redeem me from man's oppression that I may keep your precepts. Make your face shine upon your servant and teach me your statutes. In college, I had a professor, an anthropology professor, who told me the story of visiting this indigenous tribe in the rainforest. And at dinner, he reached out and he grabbed a roll and put it on his plate. And at that moment, all of the tribal warriors stood up prepared to fight him. His interpreter stood up started speaking a different language. It calmed everything down. And what my professor realized 
was that he had reached out and grabbed the food with his left hand. In this tribe, the left hand is what you use to clean yourself up with after you go to the bathroom. Unknowing to him, he had committed a great offense of immense disrespect. And what we see in Psalm 119, 133, and 134 is that it's God's word which sets us free from slavery to sin, slavery to iniquity, slavery to rule breaking, which even if we, like that man, were unaware of, that we were also condemned by it. You see, all of us are born into the problem of sin. And it's part of God's kindness in his word to alert us to this dilemma so that it might set us free from it. To tell us we have been living wrong. We have been worshiping the wrong things. That we are in danger if we don't realize our problem. And this is the first way God's word is effective. It is effective to bring us freedom from sin. God's word shows us the hidden slavery of sin, the oppression of man. It illuminates the iniquity that we do not want to have mastery over us. And it liberates us in joyful Christ-like obedience. There's this wild story in 2 Chronicles 34 where King Josiah is repairing the temple. And as the construction workers were going through kind of the old temple area, they found the book of the law. The book of Moses. We're not sure if this was specifically the book of Deuteronomy or if it was the whole Pentateuch, the whole first five books of the Bible. But they got it and no one knew what it was. Because at that point in time, the nation of Israel had completely forgotten God's law. They claimed to worship God, which is so easy to do. And yet they didn't know what God had spoken, which is unfortunately most of what Christianity in the Western world is. Claiming to know God without ever listening to God. And so what happened is in this idolatrous nation, they discover this book and they don't know what to do. So it gets passed from construction worker to construction worker and eventually goes to scribes, and eventually goes to the priests and the priests eventually give it to the king, King Josiah. And Josiah reads that book and look at his response in 2 Chronicles 34 verses 19 through 21. He says this, and when the king heard the words of the law, he tore his clothes. And the king commanded Hilkiah, Ahiakam, the son of Shaphan, Abdon, the son of Micah, Shaphan, the secretary, and Asiah, the king's servant, saying, go, inquire of the Lord for me and those who are left in Israel and in Judah concerning the words of this book that has been found. For great is the wrath of the Lord that is poured out on us because our fathers have not kept the words of the Lord to do all that is written in this book. Josiah, who in all purposes was a good king, thought he was serving God all right. And yet when he read God's word, he realized that they did nothing right that the whole of the kingdom was out of line with what God desired and that living in open disobedience to the king of kings was to incur the wrath of the king. As we read God's word, as you read God's word, there'll be moments where you encounter in stunning clarity the condemnation of your own sins, where you realize that you do not measure up as God would have you. As the author of Hebrews says in Hebrews 4 verse 12, it says, For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing the division of the soul and of the spirit and of the joints and of the marrow and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. As we read God's word, God's word through the power of the Holy Spirit reads us. It pierces us. It exposes us. But as much as God's word convicts us, just like that professor experienced living in unknown sin, and just as Josiah believed, it also shows us in the midst of conviction the way forward. Josiah immediately called for the priests. And why is that? Because he knew that this law, which they had just read, had said that should the people find themselves in brokenness of sin, that they should go to the priests and the priests would atone for it and they would make redemption possible. You see, God's word reveals the problem, but it also reveals the solution. 
And look at the goal of God's word back in Psalm 119. Listen to what it should produce in us in verses 133 through 44. Keep steady my steps according to your promise. Let no iniquity get dominion over me. Redeem me from man's oppression that I may keep your precepts. The purpose of God's word is that what we might set aside sin for the freedom of obedience. It calls us to obedience. It shows us how to live. It calls us out of slavery and fear of man into direct obedience towards God. For $15 a month, you can subscribe to a program called Masterclass. And Masterclass is this collection of lectures where you can go to people outstanding in their field and you can learn from them. So you can learn drumming from Ringo Starr or you can learn cooking from Gordon Ramsay. And people pay for this because they know they want experts to teach them how to thrive in their areas of skill. But in the pages of scripture is not only what we need to know to be saved, but the wonderful privilege of being taught by God himself how to live a life of thriving, obedient joy, how to walk in righteousness, how to love like Jesus, how to parent like God parents us. And this teaching in scripture is part of God's plan of caring for his church. In the book of uh, 1 Timothy, Paul wrote to a young pastor named Timothy who is in way over his head, And look at what he says in 1 Timothy 4.13. He says, until I come, devote yourself to the public reading of scripture. Now, when you hear that, you might think preaching, but actually what he goes on to say is then preach the word. So Paul here told the church to be committed even to the simple reading of scripture. Why? Because when we don't know what to do, or even when your pastors are wrestling through what to do or feel overwhelmed, scripture gives us a way forward. Scripture teaches us how to live. It shapes our life in a positive way. Once more, Paul speaks to Timothy in the book of 2 Timothy and listen to the effect God's word has on the man of God. Verses 14 through 17. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and firmly believed knowing from whom you learned it and how from your childhood you've been acquainted with these sacred writings, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture is breathed out for God and is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. God's word produces change. It is the means in which we become more Christ-like, more diligent in our efforts for glory. But more powerful than the change we experience in scripture is the person we experience in scripture. And this is the second effect of God's word. This is where we see that scripture is effective to show us God's favor. Now look at the bookends of the passage we just read in Psalm 119. We looked at the context of obedience in verses 33 and 34, but look with me at verse 132 and 135. 132 says, turn to me and be gracious to me as is your way with those who love your name. Verse 135, make your face shine upon your servant and teach me your statutes. See, this is so important for us to see. Because the bread, which holds those moral obligations of obedience, as beautiful and as wonderful as being set free from sin and slavery and being shown what obedience looks like, those only can be found inside of the favor God gives to his people through his word. It is a relationship with God in verses 132 and 135, which makes obedience to God in verses 133 and 134 possible. If you've noticed, there are seven different words that David uses in this text to describe scripture. If, if Kids, if you have your Bible open, I wanna show you all seven of these right now. We see your testimonies, are wonderful. The unfolding of your word gives light. I long for your commandments. Turn to me and be gracious to me. Uh, where am I going here? As you, with those who love your name, keep my steps according to your promise. Redeem me from man's oppression that I might keep your precepts. 
Make your face shine on your servant and teach me your statutes. My eyes shed streams of tears because people do not keep your law. Testimony, word, commands, promise, precepts, statutes, and law. God's word is incredibly varied. Sometimes it commands, sometimes it communicates, sometimes it instructs, sometimes it describes, sometimes it breaks down, and sometimes it builds up. But in the midst of all kinds of scripture, doing all kinds of things, it reveals one God in radiant beauty. Scripture doesn't exist so that you might merely obey God. Scripture exists so that by the promise of God, you might know God's love for you in Jesus Christ and in so doing, receive his grace, his love, and his favor. God doesn't want you to simply have a relationship with his rules. He wants you to have a relationship with him. And when you see the beauty of the God who wants to give you his favor, your relationship towards his rules change. David screams in Psalm 119, how I love your law. But the Bible is not ultimately a book about you. It is a book about a radiant, glorious, magnificent God and how through the work of the gospel, he has favor on broken sinners through Jesus Christ. And that favor isn't simply a rubber stamp of forgiven. It is a new name given to you as a child. God's word changes our relationship with him. And that's the beauty of the gospel. It's only the gospel in which obedience and change comes in the confines of grace. The world wants change, and then it'll give you grace. Be better, be smarter, be wealthier, be more socially aware, be more political, and then you can get in. But God reveals himself in scripture as the God who gives grace and then empowers us and calls us to change. And the central point in which God reveals who he is, his grace to us, and what we need to do to receive that grace is in the person and work of Jesus Christ. Look at what Jesus said to a group of individuals who were trying to find God's favor based off of their efforts and their works. This is in John chapter five, verses 39 through 40. Jesus says, you search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. And it is they that bear witness about me. Yet you refuse to come to me that you may have life. What is the center of scripture? Jesus Christ. He is the one who makes sense of the whole story. He is the one who shows us the nature of the Father in his perfect loving life. But he is also the one who shows us the nature of sinners in his death on a substitutionary cross in your place. Scripture can be wonderfully effective for many things. It can be effective for parenting and for relationships and for finances and for marriage and for conflict resolution, for po- for political way keeping, and for so much more. But to be a Christian is to see primarily the effectiveness in scripture as its ability to show you the way back to God through Jesus Christ. Look at how John puts this in the conclusion of his gospel. In John chapter 20, he said this, now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. And this is what leads us to our last point today. We read because God's word is needed. Look at where David lands this plane in verse 136. My eyes shed streams of tears because people do not keep your law. If this word is wonderful, if this word displays not just the law of what we do, but that baked into God's law is his covenant to bear the penalties of our sin in the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, if this 
word gives us the favor of God through faith in his son. If this word ransoms back lost and lonely sinners out of isolation and slavery into purpose and freedom through the cross, then this word gives us evangelistic empathy. It causes us to look into the world at those who do not see God's word as wonderful and it grieves us and motivates us to show them his beauty in scripture. It reveals to us the goodness of Jesus so that we might invite more and more people to know God as he's communicated us in his word. Which means if you're one who struggles with where to start in evangelism, God's word is your nearest friend. We often think that if we want to be great evangelists, we need to have a five-point presentation of how the truth claims of scripture interact with and slay the truth claims of our world. And those are good, and there's wonderful works to be done in the field of apologetics. But to just invite your neighbor to read God's word with you is a wonderfully sufficient means of evangelism. It's as simple as that. I know one member in our church who just a couple weeks ago invited his Mormon neighbor to study God's word with him. And church, would you pray for that? Would you pray that God would open his eyes to behold wondrous things out of his law? Because how were you saved, Peter said? By the living and abiding word of God. And if it saved you, it's going to save others. If the reading of and the proclamation of God's revealed word in scripture saved you, it will save others. It will bear fruit. It will ransom the lost. There's an old children's song which holds a rich doctrinal truth that goes like this. Perhaps you've heard it. Jesus loves me, this I know. For the Bible tells me so. If you ask most people in America, Does Jesus love me? Most of them will probably say yes. But do they know it? As the Bible has said so. How can you know God's love for you? By hearing what the Bible says. By hearing God's word and believing it. Our world's benediction of salvation changes daily. What was sufficient to qualify you yesterday might be by tomorrow morning already outdated, and certainly by next year, it will fail. But to hear what scripture says is to hear something which endures through all eternity. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of the Lord endures forever. In John chapter six, many of Jesus' disciples are deserting him and he turns to his 12 and he says to them, do you want to leave me too? And in John 6, 68, they respond, to whom else would we go? For you have the words of eternal life. We need God's word. For apart from it, we will have only tears eternally. Our world needs God's word because it's only in it do they encounter the saving words of life. This is why as we'll do in a moment when we confess sin together, we share an assurance of pardon. That is an assurance that Jesus really has done something, that Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so, that no matter what the world says, no matter what my sinful heart says, no matter the darts of the enemy, that if I come to faith in Jesus Christ, that his word is sufficient. Have you thought of that today? And does that drive you to know that word more fully? Have you thought of that today? Does that word drive you to those who are lost? A sermon on scripture. I want us to consider some scripture today. Is this the need in your heart? Isaiah 118. Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be whiter than snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall be like wool. Matthew 11, 28 through 29. Come to me, all who labor and who are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, 
for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Jeremiah 31, 33 through 34. For this is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts. And I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And no longer shall each one teach his neighbor and each his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me. In other words, that division of law from the outside has gone away, and it is only salvation from the inside. From the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sin no more. Would you like to take God at his word? Romans 10, 8 through 13. But what does it say? That the word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith that we proclaim. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. For the scripture says, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek, for the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Would you like to take God at his word? Dear church, let us read God's word. For in it we encounter Christ who is the word of God, who saves us and gives us life. Let's pray. Lord, we pray that you would make us to pant for your word. We pray that as we confess sin in a moment, that you give us clarity on where we have sinned by not viewing your word as we ought. We have treasured perhaps the word of the world or the word of our spouse or the word of our own heart as being what is sufficient to bring us joy and salvation. And Lord, we pray that you work in this body a mighty hunger to know your word that we might, like Philip in Acts 8, speedily go to those passing by in chariots to explain to them the gospel from all of Scripture and that souls might be saved. We pray that those who are stuck in troughs of darkness will learn to preach the good news of God's word to themselves. Why are you downcast, O my soul? Why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God, for I will again worship you, my Savior and my God. For those who wrestle with wounds of sin, may they understand that, that for those, there is now therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For those weary from the weight of the world, may they consider that the trials of this present age are of no comparison to the glories which are yet to come. Lord, you have made us new by your word. Sustain us in your word through the power of the Holy Spirit. We pray this in your name. Amen.